Okay, this tutorial is on naming ionic compounds and naming covalent compounds. So first we'll go um, with the theory, like why, why it's so important to naming compounds. Um, so suppose you have uh, suppose you have this problem where you have um, uh, sodium. This is a uh, precipitation reaction. So suppose you have sodium phosphate reacting with copper to nitrate. <clears throat> this is what's called a precipitation reaction where both of your starting ingredients are soluble so they would both be in ion form um, PO4 3 minus and then that 2 right there which we'll be covering in this tutorial means that co your copper has a 2 plus charge and then nitrate is NO3 minus 1 and then so you write your um, you crisscross your charges and then you write your formulas so this is reacting with, this would be aqueous, and it's reacting with this. Aqueous means dissolved. Uh, that two means you have two of these, and anytime you have more than one polyatomic in parentheses is aqueous. Um, the two will switch, so this will combine with this. And then this one combines with this one. And that's how and that's how you get your products. So you're gonna get copper phosphate, which just happens to be solid. And plus sodium nitrate, which is also soluble. Uh, so here's the problem. If you didn't know these charges, then you wouldn't know these subscripts, and then you wouldn't know the uh, quantities of atoms involved in this process. And then lastly, you wouldn't know how to balance this. So on this side, if you get all these numbers right, the charges correctly, and this all stems from the names, a little bit of memorization for this one and this one, uh, but all, all this goes back to knowing the charges that they make which tells you the quantities of ions they make when they form compounds and then you could balance it properly and then balancing it properly will lead you to the right answer if you have a question like this if you have five liters of 0.2 molar of this reacts with two liters of 0.1 molar of this so if you get these, if these are incorrect, you're going to have the wrong balancing, and then you'll have the mol wrong mole-to-mole -mole ratios when you try to do answer this problem. So actually, I, don't, I never even made a problem. But what what if what if I wrote how much product forms, how much solid product forms in grams? So you're going to at some point need to compare the mole ratios, so the balanced numbers of all these ingredients, at some point to answer this question, you're going to need to do that. It all goes back to writing the formulas correctly. So it, if you go ahead and balance this, you would need a 2 here to balance the nitrate, because there's 2 on this side. You would need a 3 here, actually. Because of that copper, now you have six nitrates, so you need to change this number and put a six there. And now you have six sodiums because of that six, so you'd put a two there, and then it's balanced. That two also fixes the phosphate, and then it would be balanced. So these numbers, again, are, they're not possible. Um, it all, like the seed for all of this, for answering this, all started with going from names the formulas and getting the formulas correct so <clears throat> that's kind of like in the in the future we should we're, we're gonna be able hopefully to answer questions like this so to get there we need to go cover how to name okay so um, 
one of the, the first things is to, to uh, on your periodic table, if you don't already, is the main group elements. So main group is the, the, what's called the S column and the P column, and which basically excludes the transition metals, um, is go ahead and uh, above each column, like right here, here, one through eight, go ahead and put these charges. And X is, X is generic for any element. Um, so any element in that column or family. So all of column two, for example, or column two A, it makes a, a two plus charge when they make ions. So column three makes a three plus. Typically, you pretty much only see aluminum in ionic compounds. And that covers the cations. Five, six, and seven make anions. So uh, column five is a, is a, makes a three minus. So nitrogen usually makes a three minus. Phosphorus usually makes a three minus. Column six make two minuses. <clears throat> and column seven, the halogens, make a minus one. And we usually don't write the number one. We just write like fluoride ion, chloride ion, bromide ion, etc. Okay, so go ahead and just pause the video, <clears throat> and if you haven't, if you don't have these on your periodic table, then add them above each column. So that's going. If we go back to this one here for main group uh, elements, that's how we know that sodium makes a plus one. It's in the first column. The other rules predict the other ions we see here, but that's like step one is knowing this. Okay, <clears throat> um, so ionic, what is an ionic bond? It's typically a, uh, a metal, so these are all metals on the periodic table, bonded with a nonmetal. So nonmetals, they like to gain electrons, these are all nonmetals, and metals typically like to gain electrons. Oh, I'm sorry, I just messed that up. So metals typically lose electrons, that's why they have a plus charge, because they have excess protons. And then the nonmetals like to get these electrons from metals. Um, they happen to be closer to their octets, and so they like to try to fill their octet octets by gaining a couple extra electrons. This has five um, valence electrons, six and seven, so they're real close to getting eight. These, on the other hand, are real are closer to when they lose these electrons on their next shell, then they have a full set of eight on their previous shell. So ionic bonds uh, form between metals and nonmetals. So if we look at a uh, full picture of a periodic table, really bad picture. But all of these, if you see this staircase on your periodic table, these are the nonmetals, and they typically make minuses. And these are the metals, including transition. So you won't see, like, you'll never see iron making a, like a minus charge. So these all make um, positive, these all make cations. These all make anions. <clears throat> so we're going to cover in this video uh, ionic bonding and covalent bonding mainly. So with ionic, it's a metal and a non-metal. Um, and you just name the two ions. Uh, if you have uh, more than one nonmetal, so a nonmetal bonded to a nonmetal, for example, carbon dioxide, most uh, organic uh, things, like things that are like uh, living or once were living, like carbon based molecules, are typically nonmetals. Uh, these come together to make covalent bonds. They have it has a different naming scheme. So we use prefixes to indicate the subscripts.
So this would be called carbon and then dioxide because there's two oxygens. On ionic bonding, we do not use prefixes. You just name the two ions. <clears throat> so that's one important uh, side note about naming. So the next couple slides are going to be covering strictly ionic bonding, and then on the last slide will be covalent bonding. And somewhere in the middle, we'll cover acids, how to name acids. Okay, transition metals. So they can have more than one. So on my a couple slides ago, we went over uh, main group elements. So what about transition metals? They can have more than one charge. So you have to specify with Roman numerals in the name. Um, and then you write that charge in parentheses and the Roman numerals in parentheses after the name. So for example, copper can be either 2 plus or 3 plus. And uh, so if we have this compound, copper, copper and two chloride ions, it means that that two, it came from the charge on copper. So it means that copper was a 2 plus and chloride is always a 1 minus. So if you have copper 3 chloride, that means you have 3 chlorides. That 3 is indicating that copper had a 3 plus charge on it. So it would be copper 3 plus. And then uh, um, but the chloride is always, always the same. So <clears throat> we'll go over some examples tomorrow in class, too, that has uh, transition, more transition metals to look at. Um, a couple special notes about transition metals. Um, the following three do not have Roman numerals. Cadmium, so in, in this previous slide I said that they can have more than one. There are a couple transition metals that they only have one, so you do not need the Roman numeral to specify. So for example, cadmium is always a two plus. So if you have like cadmium chloride, it would be that. You wouldn't have to specify. You wouldn't have to write cadmium to chloride because cadmium always only, only makes a 2 plus. So you don't need that part. Not necessary. Okay, similar with uh, zinc, it's always a 2 plus. And silver is always a 1 plus. Something that we use a lot this year is silver nitrate, which is AgNO3. Uh, and when you, if you had to write out the name, you would write silver, and you, you do not need a one to indicate the one plus. So you would just write silver nitrate. These three, they come up often enough to where you should know this, um, that th these are the ones that don't need Roman numerals. There are, I think there's a couple others, but these ones are the most common. <clears throat> Another special note is beware of reduced subscripts. So for example, here's kind of like a like a, uh, a tricky one that got reduced. So um, this uh, this two here, it means that uh, manganese actually had a four plus, and your oxygen is always a two minus. So if if you uh, the only other option for this is to write it like this to say that this was a 2 plus and oxygen is a 1 minus. But we know this is in 6A, and 6A doesn't make a 1 minus. It's always a 2 minus. So this is a 2 minus, and just by reasoning, logic, it must mean that this was a 4 plus. So when you crisscross this, you would get MN, just working backwards from this one, you get MN2O4, which is reduced to that 2 and the 4 can be reduced to 1 and 2. So it'll be MN1, O, 2. So it's, it's kind of tricky, but if you work backwards and you realize that oxygen is not a minus 1, it's always a minus 2, you can catch something like that. Uh, that's really detailed. It may not ever come up, but just in case it does. OK, so a couple other notes about, poly if you notice, on poly the polyatomic ions. There's ites and then there's eights. So on sulfite, um, if you noticed on that list of polyatomic ions, um, the ones that have ite usually typically have one less oxygen. Okay, and if it has eight, it usually has one more than the ite version. Okay, and then the charges are the same. 
So this is just a way to, um, if you kind of notice that, you can see a pattern, and it sort of helps with the memorization, or I, I find. So just one little note about when you have nitrate and nitrite and sulfite versus sulfate. So, oh, okay, so naming acids. Um, there's a couple rules for naming acids. If you have, um, it depends on the anion of your acid. So acids can be halogen or they could be polyatomic ions. So if your acid is a halogen, so for example, if the anion is one of these in column seven, um, so for example, if you have like HF, HCl, acids typically have a hydrogen on the front if it's a bronsted lowry acid, or HI. Okay, so uh, if you have one of those, uh, this is the way to name it. So you have to use the prefix hydro, and then the base of the element, the halogen, and then you add the suffix ic when you name it. So for example, HCl would be hydro, and this is, this is chlorine, but you drop the ene part, and you add ic. So you drop this part, and you add the suffix ic. So this would be hydrochloric acid, like L. Um, yeah, hydrochloric acid. Okay, if you have um, if you have HBr, it would be called hydro, and this is bromine, or the ion is actually bromide. So you drop the ide part and you add ic. So this would be hydrobrom, and then the suffix ic, and then you add acid to complete the name. There's, there's two rules if the acids is, is a polyatomic uh, anion. Okay, so if it's, if it ends in eight, you name it, you don't, you do not use hydro. Uh, so for example, if you have um, H, so if you put an H on the front, so hydrogen always makes a plus one. So if you have H plus and SO4, two minus, this, if you crisscross that, you would have H2SO4. Okay, and the way to name that is you don't use the prefix hydro. That's only for halogens. Okay, so no hydro. Um, and you use the name of the actual the polyatomic ion. So it would be sol. All right, this example would actually be called sulfuric. Sulfuric acid. Another example, if you had HNO3, uh, this ion is nitrate. So we drop the 8 and we add ic. So this would be called, HNO3 would be called nitric acid. Okay, and uh, I'll, I'll, do, uh, I'll do one more using this one. So if you have this, for example, H. H3COO. This ion is <clears throat> this ion is acetate. So drop the eight and add ic. So this would be called acetic acid. Okay. Um, now, if your polyatomic ion ends in ite, then you don't use ic. So you use uh, you use us O U S. So you use that as your suffix. So for example, if you have H2SO3, this would be called sol. So this is the ion sulfite, so it would be called sol, we have L sulfurous acid. Okay, if you have, this should, this should be N2 here. So if you have HNO2, this ion is nitrate, nitrite, so this would be called uh, nitrous acid. So a couple examples on acids. Okay, so I have a uh, oh another another uh, slide on naming. On um, if you see these, so these are really common. Um, th these are the most common. Is uh, these are called like these oxy halide. Uh, polyatomic ions. So if you if you have uh, if you have notice the number of oxygens is increasing by one. So it goes one, two, 
three and four. So look, notice how the name changes. So it'd be hypo if there's only one, and then ite. This one, if there's one more oxygen, there's no hypo on the front here. So it's just called chlorite. When you get to three oxygens, it goes from ite to eight. Um, and then when you get to four, you have eight, and you add the prefix per, so it'd be per chlorate. Um, you could do this with any of the oxyhalogen um, anions. So for example, if you have uh, BRO minus one. So you could do this uh, in the same column. You could make this analogous to this, okay, and use this kind of pattern here. So to name this one, it would be called hypo bromite. Okay, BRO2, um, I would like you guys to try that one. Um, BRO3 is now you go from I to A at this at this point so this would be called the bromate ion um, and if you have BRO4 minus this would be called per bromate so sometimes you can name stuff that you've never even seen before just based on what you have seen the and use the pattern okay and uh, use what would the ion be for arsenate so if you look at arsenate Arsenic is in the same column as, phos as uh, phosphate, and phosphate is this. So sometimes you can name and write formulas for stuff that you've never seen just by seeing uh, something similar that's in the same column. So see if you could write the uh, the ion here for this one. Okay, and then I'll, I'll check those for, for work tomorrow in class. Okay, so here's a couple practice questions. So you're... Um, your uh, your task here is to try to complete the missing information in this chart. Um, so for I, I could do I could do one of these just to give you an example. So for number one, um, you're given the formula but not the ions or the name. So we have to fill in this missing information, and the ions would be there's there's one BrO minus one. If there were more than one hydrogen, there would be a number here. So there's only one of those two. So that means, uh, since there's only one here and one here, that means BRO has a minus one. It's kind of like reverse crisscrossing. So this one here is because bromate, or uh, sorry, hypobromite has a one minus. And that one there is because hydrogen is a plus one. Okay, and then this would be called hypo bromide. Okay, see if you could name two, three, four, and five. You could pause it, write it down, then I'm moving on to the next slide. So, naming covalent compounds. This is actually pretty easy, naming covalent compounds. They use numerical prefixes. So they use uh, two, or actually, there's actually one for one. One would be mono, Two is di, three is tri, four is tetra, five is penta, six is hexa, seven is hecta. Octa, nine is nana, ten is deca. It's rare to see these higher numbered ones. Molecules just start to get unstable when there's that many of the same atom. Um, the one most common are one through five. Okay, so just a couple examples. So NO2, um, there's one little thing on when, to, when and when not to use mono. If you, if you only have one of the first atom, Don't use the prefix mono. But if you have one of the second one, then use mono. I'll give you a real common example of that one. So let's try to name this one. This would be nitrogen. So no mono, even though there's only one. Nitrogen, there's two oxygens. So there, it would be nitrogen dioxide. Notice these are both nonmetals. Nitrogen, nonmetal, oxygen. 
This is a non-metal. So if I draw a little periodic table, this is a really awful one. Nitrogen is right here. Oxygen is right here. So these are both on the right side of the staircase. So they're non-metals. Here's a really common example. If you have CO2 and CO of when and when not to use mono. So here we don't use mono. For, so this would be carbon dioxide. Again, both non-metals. Carbon is over here. Oxygen is over here. Here we have... Um, So don't use mono on the first atom. Yeah, so don't you, but you only have one of the second ones, so then you would use mono. So you would call this carbon um, monoxide and drop the second O to make it sound right. Here's another example of one where you have really big numbers. So you have PO10. P4O10, this would be called tetraphosphorus deca oxide. Okay, so it's pretty easy to name these and go back and forth if you had to. Okay, so uh, we'll uh, continue these. We'll do a little bit more um, practice on these in, in class tomorrow.